Seeds of Radio. You are listening to Texas History Lessons, a slow walk through Texas history made in Texas by a Texan for everyone everywhere. Welcome to Texas History Lessons. I'm Michael, and let's begin our look at the many significant events in Texas history. Better late than never. Aside from being the day of my birth many, many years ago, September 10th marks some very special days. On September 10th, 1770, Jose de Escondon died in Mexico City. Now, why is he important? It's an important day to remember because it allows us to recall the significant contributions this man made, who's known as the father of South Texas and the lower Rio Grande Valley. He was born in Spain in 1700 and arrived in Mexico in 1715. After a career in the military, he established a reputation in warfare during the 1730s and 1740s with resistant indigenous nations in Mexico's north-central mining districts, especially against the Chichimacas. This reputation resulted in Escondón gaining the position as the colonizer and first governor of Nuevo Santander, which had a territory reaching from the Panuco River in Mexico to the Rio Grande and beyond to the Nueces. His activities resulted in the establishment of over 20 towns and several missions. Among them are Camargo in 1749, across from present-day Rio Grande City, Texas, Reynosa, Mier, and Revilla, south of the Rio Grande. To the north of that river, he saw to the creation of Laredo and Nuestra Señora de los Dolores Hacienda. As the Texas General Land Office states in an article they published online, Escondón's exploration, mapping, and colonization provided the foundation for Spain to strengthen its hold on the remote territory that became Texas. Two years after Escondón died, another significant event also occurred on September 10th, this time in 1772, that played a role in Texas's development. King Charles III of Spain issued the new regulations for presidios on September 10, 1772, and these were based on recommendations of the Marquis de Ruby that were made in 1769 after he spent a very long 23-month inspection tour ranging from Sonora to Texas. Now some context here. After the end of the French and Indian War in 1763, Spain had gained the Louisiana Territory from France, so Texas was no longer a buffer against France. So these regulations created the Provincias Internas, which were a large semi-autonomous administrative unit of nine provinces that included Texas. The regulations called for a line of 15 presidios spaced 100 miles apart to be established from the Gulf of California to El Paso and then along the Rio Grande to San Juan Bautista and then across the Matagorda Bay. Now, San Antonio was above this. San Antonio was not abandoned after this change, but the settlers of East Texas were ordered to move to Strengthen Bear, which also became the provincial capital. Another aspect of this new policy called for a more peaceful approach to relating with the Comanches and hardening of activities against the Apaches. Instead of being aggressive against Comanches, they were going to try to just have a better trade-based relationship with them, kind of more along the lines of the French approach, which they had had in their territories. The settlers of Nacogdoches, however... Numbering about 500 in 1772 were not happy about the order to abandon their homes. Two of these, especially Gil Ibarbo and Gil Flores, were among those disappointed settlers, and they made the long journey all the way to Mexico City to request attention to their disappointment. Now, something that we should also note, they were accompanied by Texita, or Texita, a Hacienda leader, 
who desired the Spanish presence to remain in East Texas. They made a good argument that Viceroy agreed to their pleas and allowed them to establish a settlement on the Trinity River where the El Camino de Real passed. This was the establishment of Bucareli. But by 1777, most of the settlers had moved back without permission to the Nacogdoches area, which remained a firm Spanish presence in East Texas and an important town for early Texas in the 1800s. Now, this brings us to one of the most significant events in Texas history that ever happened in September. But first, let's take a brief break to thank Age of Radio for hosting Texas History Lessons and then look at September 16th, 1810. Early in the morning of September 16th, 1810, two worried men woke a priest named Father Miguel Hidalgo y Costilla with a message that he and a number of others were in great danger. Now, Father Hidalgo was an interesting man, and some might say, when looking further into his life, that that he acted in ways that some might not consider very priest-like. That's for another day when we look at him a little bit closer. Let's just say that he's a very well-educated man and influenced by enlightenment and ideas. And this being considered, Hidalgo and others like him were inspired by the success of of the American and French revolutions, and they were also angered by New Spain's racial and class oppression against its Indian and Mestizo populations. And then there were also events that had begun in Europe that triggered a response in Mexico that led Hidalgo and others to hatch a plan to launch a revolt in October of 1810. But before they could get all their preparations ready, They had been found out, and they needed to act quickly. So let's back up. Two years before, in 1808, Napoleon Bonaparte had invaded Spain. He had then forced King Charles IV into retirement, and then taken Charles IV's son, Ferdinand VII, and put him under house arrest for six years, at the country estate of the famous Frenchman Talleyrand. Napoleon then named his brother Joseph Bonaparte King of Spain. In Spain itself, Spanish patriots began to fight their war of resistance, soon aided by British forces led by the Duke of Wellington, who Napoleon, of course, we all know, would come to know quite well in later years. Spaniards rallied to fight for Ferdinand, And likewise, in Mexico, actions were started taking shape in support of Ferdinand, and people called him the Desired One, as opposed to Joseph Bonaparte being King of Spain. In Mexico, Peninsulares, who were Spaniards born in Spain, had traditionally controlled the most important positions in the government. After all this had happened across the sea, with Napoleon invading, They rallied to say that they needed to maintain control of the most important positions in government. And they were determined that they would maintain control of New Spain in the name of Ferdinand. But everybody didn't agree. Criollos, who are Spaniards born in America, whom Father Hidalgo was a Criollo, believed that the Viceroyalty should be ruled by juntas, that they could control. They also did so in the name of Ferdinand. So it was people supporting Ferdinand against people supporting Ferdinand. It's all about power, though. The Viceroy, who was a Peninsulari himself, took a look at the situation, and he shifted his support to Criollos and was going to pursue that line stay in power with their support thinking that if things worked out a certain way he might even find himself being a king of an independent Mexico and besides he's looking at this Criollos outnumbered the Peninsulares 10 to 1 unfortunately for the Viceroy a small group of Peninsulares 
learned of his plan and they attacked the vice regal palace on the evening of September 15th, 1808, arrested him and prepared to send him back to Spain. And then they replaced him with an easily manipulated leader. This was followed by Ponsolares starting a campaign of arresting Criollo leaders that stood in opposition to them. And what this led was to many Criollos going into underground activity and planning in groups like the Literary Club of Carretero, which a certain Criollo priest named Father Hidalgo was a member of. He was a priest at a small town of Dolores. And again, the story of his life and how he ended up there is quite remarkable, but we'll get into that at a later date. But all this leads us to Father Hidalgo and September 16th, 1810. So woken early on that morning and informed that he might soon be arrested, Hidalgo and his fellow conspirators had to make a decision. They could flee and hopefully escape to live in exile, or they could just crazily just sit around and wait to be arrested, or they could take action. And Hidalgo decided to act. Now, September 16th was a Sunday and a traditional market day. And Father Hidalgo ordered the church bells to be rung early. About 8 o'clock in the morning, there might have already been about 600 people in the town square. And already by that time, some of them might have already understood that something special was underway. Father Hidalgo himself, from descriptions appearance-wise, was nothing very extraordinary. He was dark-complexioned, stoop-shouldered, of middling stature, and balding with what remaining hair he had being described as very white. He was not even in his 60s yet. He was in his mid-50s. And he dressed typically, not giving too much care to his appearance, he dressed typical garb of a small-town priest, a cloak of black wool with a walking stick. He'd have a round hat and a suit of knee breeches, a waistcoat and jacket. But he was also described as a man of still being vigorous and activity with lively green eyes. So having the, had the bells rung and people gathered into Dolores, at some point he began to speak, and the words that he said have been remembered as El Grito de Dolores, the cry of Dolores. It was this cry of Dolores that led to a social revolution that reached into Texas and after many successes and failures, eventually led to Mexican independence and set the stage for the latter Texas revolt. What he said has not been passed down word for word. The best sources suggest that he told the people that the Mexico City Junta was actively planning to surrender Mexico to the French. It was then the duty, he said, of the people to join together and defend the church and defend the king, Ferdinand. It is also very possible that he promised the Indians, the indigenous-born people, an end to tribute payments. And he might also have assured that all who joined the cause would receive wages. Now, the words that he closed his statements with is what has become especially famous, the cry of Dolores. He cried out, long live Fernando, long live America, long live religion, and death to bad government. By 11 o'clock, September 16th, 1810, Father Hidalgo rode at the head of a column of some 800 men. And as the army grew, he added to his simple priestly garments a wide-brimmed hat, a large military-style sash, a saber, and two pistols, and the army would eventually number in the thousands. But he never ultimately saw success. He never saw his cause come to fruition. And later, betrayed in 1811 by a gentleman we learned about last month, he would be removed from the priesthood and executed. And then his head would be removed from his body, and it was put on display with other conspirators as a warning until Mexican independence was gained 10 years later when it was finally taken down. But September 16th, 1810 marks the beginning of the struggle for independence that led to many significant events in Texas, including the invasion initially led by Gutierrez de Lara 
that resulted in the bloodiest battle in Texas history, the 1813 Battle of Medina that we've learned about in a couple of earlier episodes. Often heralded as the father of Mexico, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that others have criticized Hidalgo's leadership and decision-making. One historian, Timothy Anna, going so far as stating Hidalgo accomplished nothing. Now, a lot of others strongly argue against this, but we will be learning more about these events in the future. Some people would like to argue about what if this had happened and what if this had happened or something else had happened. What we do know, however, is that this event led to the events that eventually resulted in the rise of Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana and the Texas Revolt of 1836 and the establishment of the Republic of Texas and then statehood within the United States of America. Many years later, after Mexican independence, Mexican President Vicente R. Guerrero issued the Guerrero Decree on September 15, 1829. This decree abolished slavery in the Republic of Mexico, except in the Isthmus of Tehuantepec. News of the decree reached Texas on October 16th, but the political chief in the Department of Texas, Ramon Musquiz, withheld its publication, believing that it violated colonization laws, which his residents in Texas would have strongly agreed with. Despite this action, Texans were worried enough they sent a petition to the president requesting an exemption. On December 2nd, the Mexican Minister of Relations announced that no change would be made respecting the status of slavery in Texas. That all being said, even though the decree was never acted on, Texas colonists did grow increasingly concerned that under Mexican rule, they might someday lose their ability to have slaves. Revolution did come. And after becoming a state, Texas became the fastest growing state in number of slaves in the 1850s. And it was then, after this, that their fear of losing their slaves finally came true with the outcome of the Civil War. Right eventually did win out. Now let's close the episode out with a few more important dates in Texas history. On September 5th, 1836, Sam Houston became the first president of the Republic of Texas. He defeated a gentleman named Henry Smith, who had been the governor of the provisional government, Mirabu B. Lamar, who we'll learn a lot about in the future, who would be a really big, strong uh, political opponent for Houston for several years. And he also beat none other than Stephen F. Austin, the man who oversaw the first legal settlement in Texas by citizens from the United States in the early 1820s. Now, during the years of the Texas Republic, things were never really at ease between Texas and Mexico. Mexico never acknowledged Texas independence. A case proven by the events of September 11th, 1842, when Mexican General Adrian Wohl captured the city of San Antonio with an army of about 1,200 soldiers. Texan troops repulsed Wool's force at the Battle of Salado Creek on September 18th, and Wool eventually withdrew to a hero's welcome with his army to Mexico. He was promoted to Major General and received the Cross of Honor. Texas, in turn, reacted with the Somerville and Mir expeditions, something that we can look forward to learning about later on. On September 3rd, 1895, the last surviving signer of the Texas Declaration of Independence, William Carroll Crawford, died visiting his son in Erath County. Had he lived another 10 days, he would have celebrated his 91st birthday. 1895, just on the cusp of the 20th century. It's amazing how closely we really are to events that happened what a lot of us realize and consider a very long time ago and as always as we always want to remember september 8th 1900 was the day that the famous and catastrophic hurricane devastated the city of galveston and as we've learned in earlier episodes this event led to many significant changes for the future of not only galveston but also texas and city government throughout the nation well, thanks for listening. That's going to wrap it up for this episode. And special thanks to Ron, Jay, Kay, Brenda, Tim, Josh, Johnny, and Rama 
for their support on Patreon. Their generosity provides great assistance researching and recording Texas history lessons. Don't forget to listen to the Wild West Extravaganza podcast and the History Cafe podcast. And for any Texas music lovers out there like me, be sure to give Hymns of the Highway podcast a listen. Speaking of music, go check out Zach Welch's new song, Ada. If you're a fan of a band like Lucero or Drive-By Turkers like I am, that's going to fit right in your wheelhouse and you're going to enjoy the heck out of it and look forward to more music from him, hopefully coming soon. And remember, as always, listen to THL Spotlight's artist Mondo Salas' music wherever you enjoy good music. He's still hard at work on the new album, and he and his wife also had a baby this September. Congratulations, and congratulations to Josh and his family. They also recently brought a new member of their family into the swirl. And so let's end the podcast with another of Mondo's songs I love. Take care of yourself. Take care of each other. Be kind. Adios. Up all the shining